Hi, everybody. My, my name is Alexandre Michy. I'm a cardiologist working in Molusson, France. And I have the pleasure today to moderate, along with uh, Dr. Ritu Taman from the US, uh, our lovely webinar uh, entitled The Best of AHA 2020 Overview, Overview of Most Important Trials and Guidelines. Uh, without uh, delaying um, the transmission, I would like to introduce uh, my uh, uh, co-speaker and co-moderator, co -moderator, uh, Dr. Ritu Thaman uh, from the US. Thank you so much, Ritu, for uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, how are you? I am good, and thank you so much for organizing this. And putting a real wonderful spin on this fantastic AHA sessions that are still ongoing as we are all gathered here and have been a tremendous uh, success so far, um, especially in light of this COVID pandemic. And despite that, the AHA has come out very strong in terms of the number of trials that have been presented that have significant clinical impact and will influence how cardiologists and other physicians practice around the world. So it is my great uh, pleasure to get started uh, with our first speaker, who is uh, from Vienna, Austria, uh, Dr. Konstantin, and he will be speaking to us about acute care and uh, what he has uh, seen and learned at the AHA. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, kind uh, introduction see. and for inviting me. It's a pleasure to provide some of the updates in acute cardiac care. And whoever works in acute cardiac care um, or in intensive care has been dealing with this um, guy in the left top corner, SARS-CoV-2. And this is just a reminder where we are right now. This is data from Europe. This was our first wave, and this is where we are right now. Um, so we are we are dealing and we will be dealing within the next weeks and months with that. And how might that actually influence our daily work? This is a very interesting uh, study that was uh, shown at AHA and published in uh, JAMA Cardiology on outcomes for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest during the COVID uh, pandemic. And this is data from the CARES uh, registry, which is a registry uh, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And the first interesting thing is that actually the incidence of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest was higher in March and April of 2020 as compared to 2019. And um, also what you can see is that the incidence was higher, the more, um, the, or the higher the incidence of COVID-19 in this specific county was. So does this affect outcomes? Yes, actually it did, unfortunately. And what we could see is that um, the sustained ROSC as the primary outcome declined in 2020 as compared to 2019. And also very interesting is that um, the resuscitation attempts were terminated more often in 2020. And this rate was actually the highest in those counties that were struck with COVID-19 the worst. Some uh, technical aspects that were presented are quite interesting. Um, they call it the head up CPR. And they could show if you tilt the head up a little bit during the CPR about 30 degrees, you get a be better coronary and cerebral perfusion pressure this is animal data though, but it would be very interesting to see this um, going on. One of the late breakers in acute cardiac care was definitely the ARREST trial. Um, many centers in uh, Europe, North America, and throughout the world have some eCPR program in place at the moment where people are go go going on to ECMO on during ongoing resuscitation. Just a reminder what kind of patients did they include? So 18 to 75 years old, with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and no ROSC after three shocks. And then they decided to bring those people into the hospital using the Lucas device and then randomize them to ECMO or no ECMO. And they actually had to stop the trial. It was an NIH trial. They had to stop the trial early because the patients on ECMO did so well. Um, there were guidelines uh, presented um, as well. They were published a few weeks ago, the AHA guidelines for CPR. Um, and this is the overview of the ALS algorithm. And actually nothing changed that much. Um, uh, there's one change here you can see on the right side, there's another um, 
link in the chain of survival. And we were talking about ECMOs, really advanced resuscitation. And this is very fancy and this is great if people survive. But if people don't do anything at the beginning, then this is actually uh, for nothing. So we have to focus and we still have to focus on bystander CPR. So I'm only going to go now into um, those uh, systems of care uh, recommendations that were uh, shown. Um, so, and the, one more thing that is uh, the most important actually is prevention, prevention of uh, cardiac arrest. And this starts in the in-hospital setting because nearly all of the in-hospital resuscitations that we see might have been prevented by some somehow. And they suggest to use early warning scoring systems with a 2B recommendation. And also that there should be rapid response teams looking at a deteriorating patient before actually the patient is in arrest. What about for, um, the recommendations for bystanders? So communities are still are encouraged to um, uh, deliver bystander CPR trainings um, and uh, public arrest defibrillation um, programs should be used. And what is new, and this is um, quite interesting and used throughout the world more often, they actually recommend the use of mobile phone technology by emergency dispatch to alert bystanders to CPR. Um, if you call in for a patient with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, they sh the uh, call taker should use the no-no-go algorithm if the patient is non, not conscious, not breathing normally, then you should go and deliver CPR. And they should actually teach people to do um, a compression only CPR. Um, and I will go to the end now here, um, talking about systems of care. You, systems are um, encouraged to use a regionalized approach um, to use cardiac arrest centers People should use registries to learn something um, and to improve further um, their measures. And debriefing is also highlighted. And one last thing is this last uh, part in the chain of survival. There were some very interesting sessions about survivorship. Um, the, some web pages have been highlighted, like lifeaftercardicarrest.com. And I think most of us are aware of this um, story of Dr. Glaucom Flecken. Um, who I always enjoyed his tweets um, on Twitter, and he actually went into cardiac arrest at home and uh, was saved by his wife who was performing CPR. So I want to conclude with this call, push and shock, and uh, this is the most important to save someone's life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Constantine. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, we will have uh, to uh, uh, pass the word uh, to um, our next colleague. So uh, thank you. Uh, so um, first of all, I would like to, to say that um, I would like to thank all the speakers. Thank you for your time. Uh, second, we had uh, a great audience tonight. Uh, more than 800 uh, cardiologists subscribed and uh, more than 200 of them are online. Um, this being said, I have the pleasure to give the word to uh, Dr. Rafael Vidar Perez from Spain. Hi, Rafael. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Ritu and Alessandro. And I will share now my screen. I have no problems. I hope you can see it. I will go from some a transversal update because digital, I think it's in many of the topics that we are going to speak today. So I will highlight some, some elements at, at least, I think, probably some of them will be repeated. Um, as you know, in the EC Congress, we have a lot of tweets and we have to say that also in AHA 20, we have a lot of tweets. This part of the digital, this part of the learning platform that Twitter is. I think many of us get no, know each other by Twitter and I think it's good to highlight the, the value. And there are a lot of things going on now on, AHA, on the hashtag of AHA 20. So I think it's interesting. If you look for digital or maybe artificial intelligence, big data in the program, you can find some interest sessions that are outside from the late breaking trials. I think good, good updates about the topic. And now they have a special section if you filter in the program. This is Health, Health Tech is the name in this Congress to find these kind of things related with digital and there were posters, moderated posters on different topics, world, uh, real world data, smartphones, artificial intelligence, telemedicine. 
and I highlight two posters that I see that sometimes we believe that we can have a, an app. It's some, something that could be helpful, but sometimes it's difficult to, 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 to create uh, how an app could help us, for example, to uh, reduce uh, hospital admissions. But it, for other things, it it's, could help us, for example, to get more patients on cardiac rehabilitation. Maybe we don't get effects in a short term, but maybe in long term to enroll patients with an app could be helpful. And also virtual care, I think with this COVID-19, we are embracing virtual care and there are science on the Congress about that topic that it could be implemented and scaled very fast and we need it, but probably it, we will keep it and possibly we will keep a hybrid model to do medicine after COVID. And now, um, 10 minutes before we were speaking about with Fauci in the Congress, there was a nice speech, uh, an update about SARS-CoV-2. Um, we, other of the speakers on this session, speak what, what was the, 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 the topic. It's now the, the need of telehealth. Before COVID, there was nothing and telehealth was, was crazing in the US a lot. And many of the visits of, of, of the office visits change to this telehealth option we can think is this good or bad it depends for what and that's the that's the point probably it's not for everything and there were there were good reviews also i recommend you to see this session you have the opportunity about this novel te technology for in management probably more people will speak about that but we are getting more things to monitor we can have a ring that could give you the saturation for example using the same system or detecting an arrhythmia not only the the smartwatch um probably these wearables could replace our strategy for arrhythmia detection. I think that's what is one of the points that we are seeing after each Congress. Also, digital health is, is related also with social media and the big data. I think it's something that we go further. There is a very, very nice talk about that also in the Congress. And another topic that was, that was explained during the Congress was also about the screening of AF. I think we will have more people speaking about this, but one of the basis is going through more than provider uh, tools also for consumer tools like uh, smartphones or smartwatches could help us also in the diagnosis we go from medical devices to consumer oriented devices this is the next change and um, some open questions also about that which is the meaning of the things that we are going to detect with a continuous monitoring that we need more things to learn and we have some trials that I want not other people will speak about them because I think it's, it's arrhythmias. There was one with a simple device that is a patch for ECG monitoring. That was the search AF trial. I think it's interesting because after the surgery, we have a lot of episodes, but many are lost because maybe we follow the patient only at the beginning. And there are many episodes after the third, during 30 days after the surgery. So this is good, these kind of strategies to make safe the life of our patients so and they found with a strategy based on this cardiac rhythm monitoring they get more AFib diagnosis i think it's something important because we were missing a lot of arrhythmias another thing that were that was shown it's a uh, the continuation of some studies of artificial intelligence applied in the ECG interpretation. You can imagine with the simple ECG, you can predict if a patient has a low ejection fraction. Now they are starting to validate it in other sources of ECG and what is the value of this. And some data, this the Eagle study is shown during this Congress. And I think it's important. And last but not least, these are the trials that, are, that we are listening now during our session so i could, couldn't tell you anything about the results because this one that was more related with digital as you see the title high tech or high touch these strategies can, can optimize patient care I, I i hope we can get more info through twitter they have uh, the value of audio discharge instructions uh, strategies based on on digital tools there were three or four trials that are going to be presented during our session. So I couldn't, couldn't go through this. And I think it's one of the most digital trials that we have during the Congress. And also the use of these technologies in poor countries, it, it could be also implanted. So I think it's, 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 it's interesting. And to, to end, this is the session that is going on. So we have to wait what's going for the final result. And I will tell you that we are also 
in the European society, we are starting very soon a digital health uh, journal and we are waiting for your submissions. It's coming 24th of November and the digital week is also near to be with us. So let's, let's stay tuned also. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Raphael. That was an extremely great uh, overview of telemedicine and telehealth that has been uh, catapulted forward by the COVID pandemic. And we'll continue to uh, continue in that vein. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a colleague, a friend, and uh, a brilliant uh, interventional cardiologist, Dr. Mirvat. And um, I will give her over and she can start on her updates on interventional cardiology. Well, thank you everybody. Um, thank you, Ritu, for this um, introduction. Certainly everybody on this platform, our friends and I've learned from them. So the uh, AHA meeting has been very rich this year. Um, and certainly the interventional cardiology updates, uh, I'm gonna try to select the most relevant uh, trials that were presented. Um, so I'll start with the first one, Alpheus trial. Now, this is actually a trial that was um, done on elective PCIs. It compared ticagrelor to clopidogrel standard dosing. And the primary endpoint was myocardial infarctions, stent thrombosis, and myocardial injury at 48 hours. And then at 30 days was the secondary endpoints uh, for this study. When you look at the primary, end, the primary outcome or the secondary outcomes, um, uh, the uh, ticagrelor was not superior, but when you look and you look at safety, it was safe. But however, if you look at the minor bleeding, whether it's at 48 hours for the primary endpoint or 30 days, the minor bleeding was in fact uh, slightly increased, uh, but not statistically significant. And the dyspnea was also obviously more frequent in the ticagrelor, and it did translate into a, a more frequent discontinuation of this drug. So when you look at the dyspnea and you look at the minor bleeding, you do know that through this trial, um, there was platelet inhib inhibition. But in terms of conclusion, the higher level of platelet in uh, inhibition did not translate into uh, clinical uh, events or reduction in outcomes in terms of periprocedural my uh, myocardial infarctions or myocardial injury in the stable subset of patients. Um, so the excess minor bleeding and dyspnea, as I mentioned, um, is probably significant of the, that there was inhibition. But when we think about it and we look at the CREDO trial, uh, it was clopidogrel against uh, placebo and it did reduce one year major adverse cardiac events. When we look at pra prasigrel, this was um, just published by Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Yulinda Mahili uh, in circulation. And effectively 30 day maze compared to clopidogrel, uh, there was no reduction. Likewise here uh, with the ticagrelor trial, there was no reduction. Let's just really quickly look at this study. Me mean age was 66, 80% were men. So again, I'm not sure we can extrapolate a whole lot about women. There were some high risk uh, patients with left main and bifurcations. Not all of the patients that were included were purely elective with no uh, tr with negative troponins. Um, but what does this tell us? What we're doing is we're actually evaluating early events. And remember, these are stable entity of patients. So really what we really need to be looking at are the late events in, in uh, stable disease. Um, more platelet inhibition, as I said, confirms that more with, confirmed by the more minor bleeding and the dyspnea, but didn't translate into reduction. Now, why is it that all across the board, the platelet inhibition and the, the function measurements have been inconsistent in most of the, the trials, primarily because there are many more factors that uh, impact outcome, and perhaps they are more profound uh, than the, the uh, platelet inhibition alone. Again, continuing with this, the one month DAPT trial, um, this one was the goal of the trial was to evaluate one month dual antiplatelet therapy uh, with uh, six to 12 months of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in patients who were undergoing percutaneous interventions. This was randomized parallel open label study. Um, the patients that were enrolled were approximately 1.5 uh, in, in each arm. Um, and in the short DAPT or the one month arm, uh, they used the BioFreedom uh, uh, stent. And in the six to 12, they used the more contemporary uh, uh, drug eluding stents such as Ultimaster. The follow-up was about 12 months. When you look at, again, the, the patients that were enrolled, 67 uh, years was the mean age, females about 31%, diabetics about 37%. But overall, this was a very low risk uh, population. So chronic kidney disease uh, were very low percentage, prior myocardial infarctions, cabbages as well. And uh, acute myocardial infarctions and complex PCIs were actually excluded uh, from the study population. So bear that in mind. 
the other significant difference compared to the trials that were published and, and presented last year, uh, um, such as the STOP DAPT and the SMART Choice, was that the uh, once they have completed their required uh, dual antiplatelet therapy or the assigned dual antiplatelet therapy uh, duration, uh, the monotherapy was consisted of aspirin. Uh, the others, it was primarily clopidogrel. So the conclusion was among patients undergoing PCI for stable disease and perhaps unstable coronary disease, one month was non-inferior to uh, the uh, six to 12 month uh, in terms of preventing adverse events as well as ischemic events, as well as bleeding events. But just remember that for stent thrombosis, this study was probably not powered to give it to you. And stent thrombosis is the number one ischemic event that we dread as an interventional cardiologist when we want to um, uh, withhold uh, dual antiplatelet early. Or, or curtail uh, the dual antiplatelet regimens. There was a signal towards benefit with the six to 12 months of DAPT among the patients who had unstable coronary disease. So perhaps this is something we should be looking into and maybe once again, lo long-term outcomes for something like that. What does concern me is this was not a two by two factorial design and yet it compared two different stent technologies. Um, whether there's an impact by inter, uh, intercoronary imaging on the outcomes, perhaps, but we don't really know, and there's no sub-study uh, uh, presented with it. Again, 17% of the short DAPT arm actually continued DAPT beyond one month, contaminating the results, perhaps. Um, the intention to treat analysis was biased towards a non-inferiority um, um, you know, outcomes, and so perhaps that's why it did meet its non-inferiority outcome. Um, I have concern about extrapolating it to high bleeding risk. These were not high bleeding risk population. So we cannot use that, even though the stent was the same stent that was used in the leaders free trial. Moving on, the rapid CTCA trial. This was presented very exciting. A lot was mentioned about the rapid CTCA, CTCA trial. Randomized parallel uh, design, suspected or provisional diagnosis of ACS were randomized to CTCA, approximately uh, over 800 in each arm, um, and against uh, usual therapy. Usual therapy is effectively uh, invasive angiography. Total enrolled over 1,700. So these are patients who had prior coronary disease, EKG changes, and elevated troponins. That is the biggest difference between this study and all its predecessors. Many of them, uh, particularly the ones that evaluated the role of CT in ER, chest pain in ER, were troponin negatives, or uh, the more recent ones were only low risk ACS. This is considered intermediate and high risk population that were enrolled. Duration was one year, mean age 62, uh, females 36% and diabetics 18%. Um, once again, the diagnostic quality was about 90%. I'm not sure this is adequate for patients who come to your emergency room and are high risk, where you're gonna say up to 10% are not interpretable studies. Um, so there's caution with that. We look at the endpoints, you look at the primary endpoints, all cause death or myocardial infarction, um, uh, whether spontaneous. Uh, and when you're looking at one year, um, the CTCA group compared with the usual group, um, there was really no difference. There was no superiority there. When you look at the secondary endpoints, invasive angiography was reduced, yes. And you can see it in the bottom uh, graph over here. So the, the, this study showed that you can actually reduce the um, number of invasive angiographies that are performed. However, that doesn't come with a penalty of increased events, but it did come at a higher cost of longer hospitalizations, 2.2 for the CTCA arm and two days for the usual care in a COVID era. I'm not sure that, I mean, that is adequate. We want to turn over patients quickly, uh, certainly in the COVID era. And the other thing is when you look at health costs, 9,000 for CTCA and 8,000 for uh, the usual care. So again, it came at a cost of longer hospitalizations and more expenditures. So overall, uh, among patients presenting with suspected ACS or um, uh, a probable diagnosis, uh, CTCA did not reduce the incidence of death or subsequent myocardial infarction in intermediate and high-risk patients. It was associated, however, with a modest increase in the length of hospitalizations and healthcare costs. What is its role in MINOCA after invasive angiography in high-risk population? Um, it's yet to be known, but what was interesting is close to 50% of the patients actually had normal, or no, well, not normal, but non-obstructive coronary artery disease uh, befitting the uh, standard definitions. My concerns, this was not a blinded study. 87% of those assigned to the CTA arm actually ended up getting the examination done, which means 13% did not. Again, very difficult for me as an interventional cardiologist to accept that because I cannot take a patient to the cath lab, define anatomy, uh, and then say, I can't define the anatomy for you. And I can't give you an anatomic risk stratification. So this is where CTA in this population falls short. 
Um, again, um, the, whether this can be uh, expanded to centers really depends on the centers and their capabilities, experience, machines, protocols, et cetera. So I'm not sure this study actually adds a whole lot at this point in time. Moving on to structural heart, the Mithras trial, clearly the only thing I want to mention here is um, our gut feeling can sometimes go against the evidence. The evidence here shows us that closure of uh, iatrogenic uh, ASD after transcatheter mitral valve repair was not superior to conservative treatment with respect to the primary endpoint of six minute walk. And it was also in line with the secondary endpoint uh, with no increase in heart failure symptoms, heart failure hospitalizations and heart failure survival. However, Heart failure hospitalizations were increased in the presence of iatrogenic ASD, irrespective of the strategy that um, uh, was selected for these patients. When you compare it with those who did not have an iatrogenic ASD at the conclusion of the, of the uh, procedure, so it may not it may be a more prognostic value, but not really causative uh, of the worst outcomes that these patients had. Remaining questions are, should we be individualizing patient-centered decisions when we choose to close or not close these iatrogenic ASDs? And then can we further stratify those who benefit versus those who do not benefit according to the degree of shunting uh, yet to be determined? And again, again, the top part is the six minute walk showing there's really no difference. And the bottom is the um, heart failure parameters. I cannot close without this. This is my final study that I'm going to actually um, uh, present to you this evening. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I love putting stents into patients, but uh, this is actually presented at AHA this year. Um, Farouk went and did a meta analysis, and his colleagues did a meta analysis of the landmark coronary trials, Freedom, Berry 2D, and Courage trial. What it showed is that in type 2 diabetic patients, lowering the LDL at one year was associated with an improved long term major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events in those who are eligible for both PCI and cabbage, both PCI and cabbage. When compared with optimal medical therapy alone, PCI is associated with a reduction of MACE only in those who achieved an LDL below 70, which means beyond putting stents in my patients, outcomes is directly related to the LDL reduction. And uh, I'm done here, thank you. Thank you so much, dear Mervat. Uh, it was an excellent presentation and uh, I, I certainly uh, learned a lot and um, uh, I really appreciate it because I'm an interventional cardiologist also. So thank you so much. I have the pleasure to um, to give the word to our lovely colleague, uh, Biljana Parapit from Serbia, which will update us on cardiovascular prevention. Hi, Biljana, how are you? Hi, Alex. Thank you so much again for the invitation and thank you for the ambassadorship position. We didn't, I didn't thank you properly still on social media, but this is, I assume, the good opportunity. So uh, my chores tonight, because we split some prevention trials among us WIC, um, so my chores tonight will be the Evanocumab, the Polypill, and the Samson trial. So without further ado, I would just like to start with Evanocumab. Why? Because uh, currently we're all clinical cardiologists online, and I think that after each big meeting, uh, we all like to have some messages that are plain and simple for us, uh, how we're going to manage our patient next day in clinic. And I am kind of happy with this distribution of trials that I got to share with you tonight. Um, I have no slides to share, so I don't be I won't be sharing my screen, but I'll be talking to you and I hope to have some comments also from the panel while I speak. So Evan Alcumab was actually designed to uh, test the primary hypercholesterolemia and family hypercholesterolemia patients who were already on previous pre-existing statin, azetamib, or, or other therapy, but in this case, they were uh, randomized to uh, Ivanocumab in uh, IV or subcutaneous. And what we actually managed to show that fortunately the LDLC was reduced within two weeks and the effect was sustained for 16 weeks, which was actually something that I assume the designs of the study were hoping for, you can find the, the study published already in New England with all the details. Now, the problem with the study is only we had 160 patients only, but yeah. I assume that due to the price of the drug and the pricing that we would be uh, having as an issue worldwide, it, it requires additional, uh, additional thinking before trying to make it available globally for a bigger trial, I assume. Now, the 
polypill concept, as we all know, is something that we all love, especially because it improves patients' compliance. And uh, uh, this year, we had a pleasure to hear two big results, and those are the TIPS-3 and the TIPS-3 aspirin trial from uh, uh, the person who actually designed the InterHeart study, and that is Dr. Salim Yusuf and his Indian colleagues. And what we have learned is actually that in uh, almost 5,000 patients that were who were randomized to be followed up for almost five years, but mainly the majority of patients were in India when we look at the at the data, which is good because we are we are battling with with uh, South Asian and Asian population data and what is the best way to treat them and reduce the cardiovascular risk. Um, we we have found that actually in this group of patients we have seen a reduction of cardiovascular composite endpoints for 21 percent, and when we added aspirin to that, the the number went almost up to 40 percent. Now, my, my clinical concern um, is that was a combination, of course, of simvastatin, atenolol, hydrochlorothiazide, and ramipril. Now, the simvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, and ramipril didn't worry me so much, but the 100 milligram atenolol really draws my attention, especially because um, this is a question for everyone now on the panel. How many of you in clinics see patients on atenolol? I know, I know we said we are going to keep the discussion for the end, but I'm just trying to, 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 to get some feedback from you guys. Apparently not so many, neither do I. Thank you so much. So that is really my concern. Who is the patient who can tolerate 100 milligram of etanolol? And finally, a trial that is, I think, uh, somehow music to a certain number of our ears when patients keep coming and complaining of their medication. Uh, the Samson trial, which actually had 60 patients in a crossover design where each patient was his own control, um, was they were all randomized to statin, placebo, or nothing. And it turned out eventually that what bothered patients most was the, the process of having the pill and not the pill itself or what we account for side effects of statins. And... With that, I will leave you all to think to tell me what are your respective opinions. We already discussed it on Twitter, as Rafael pointed out. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to discuss it further with uh, Dr. Aniragi towards the end when he will be joining us also as a discussant. But without further ado, I give the baton back to who's next, I think. Um, I will. Um, in, thank you so much, Belanja. And um, those were very... Uh, interesting trials of prevention and controversial, uh, both in regards to um, the controversy of mineral oil and also the controversy over what actually is a nocebo versus placebo effect in the Samson uh, trial, uh, which was very cleverly designed. And, and so the next study um, will studies uh, will be presented by a dear friend, a colleague, and a brilliant EP specialist, Dr. Um, Annabelle Vogelman. Thank you so much, Ritu. Um, so I was, thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, about the summary of atrial fibrillation trials uh, that were presented at the AHA. So I'm gonna talk about prevention, treatment, and detection of atrial fibrillation and all this is really to try to decrease cardiovascular events, especially strokes from atrial fibrillation. So the first trial uh, was the vital rhythms uh, trial. And studies have shown that people who eat fish tend to have less atrial fibrillation. In addition, we know that vitamin D deficiency and hypertension can increase cardiovascular events. So this trial, was a, a huge trial and, and omega-3 fatty acids have been studied before to prevent atrial fibrillation. They had less people, less uh, patients in the trial and shorter um, time. So this trial, I think will bury the idea that giving omega-3 fatty acids to prevent atrial fibrillation. This was uh, done by, this was presented by Dr. Christine Albert on behalf of the vitamin, the, the vital um, study. 
The viral rhythm trial is an ancillary trial of the VITAL trial, which is a primary prevention study of cardiovascular disease and cancer prevention in over 25,000 American men and women. They studied whether daily supplementation with 2,000 inter international units of vitamin D3 or omega-3 fatty acids, um, which had 460 milligrams of EPA and 380 milligrams of DHA would prevent atrial fibrillation. And this was a very long trial. After a follow-up period of 5.3 years, neither supplementation reduced or increased the incidence of atrial fibrillation. This was the um, outcome for the um, omega-3 fatty acids. And the next slide is the vitamin D um, outcomes. So you can see that there was no significant difference in patients who were given vitamin D or vitamin or omega-3 fatty acids in preventing atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, we're gonna to continue to have to try to control that blood pressure, control the diabetes, tell our patients to stop drinking too much alcohol and um, try to exercise and decrease their weight so uh, that they don't get sleep apnea to try to prevent atrial fibrillation. You can't just take a pill to prevent atrial fibrillation. The next trial, which I am so excited was finally done, is called the RIVER trial, rivaroxaban versus warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation and bioprosthetic mitral valves. And this was um, presented by Dr. Verwanger from uh, Brazil, and it was supported by and funded by um, several health systems from Brazil, as well as Bayer um, Pharmaceuticals. This study um, was to look at non valvular atrial fibrillation. Um, this, was, this study was actually to look at uh, patients with valvular atrial fibrillation. And uh, the definition of non-valvular atrial fibrillation was um, defined in the 2019 guidelines because there was so much confusion about, about what is valvular atrial fibrillation versus non-valvular atrial fibrillation because some people were using um, the novel anticoagulants in patients with, with bioprosthetic valves. So the definition um, is non-valvular atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation in the absence of moderate to severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical heart valve. So I'm glad that they really specifically said mechanical because a lot of us were already using um, novel anticoagulants or direct anticoagulants for patients with bioprosthetic valves. There, this was because we saw that there were some patients, but a very small number of patients in the Aristotle trial using apixaban and engaged to me trial using a, uh, a doxaban in patients with mitral bioprosthetic valves. Well, this trial was a welcome study. They studied 1,005 patients in patients with bioprosthetic mitral valves and atrial fibrillation. And what they found was that um, um, rivaroxaban was non-inferior to warfarin with respect to mean time free from death, major cardiovascular events, or major bleeding. This trial, I think, will give clinicians a welcome peace of mind when we're prescribing novel anticoagulants to patients with atrial fibrillation and bioprosthetic mitral valves. Thank you, Brazilian colleagues, for doing that. The next trial I'm going to talk about is a screening trial. This is called the VITAL AF trial, not to be confused with VITAL rhythm trial, but this is the VITAL AF trial. It's also done by the MGH group from Harvard, and it's a single um, center trial that studied over 35,000 patients in a primary care setting with no history of atrial fibrillation to determine if point of care single lead determination would lead, would identify patients with a culture asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. So you can imagine over 35,000 patients in all of these clinics at, at, from Harvard. So whether it's a, Harvard is just really good that they didn't find any difference in the screening patients and the control patients. So usual care in the light blue versus um, the screening uh, patients in the dark blue. What they found was that patients who were actively screened for atrial fibrillation was only effective in the patients over the age of 85 years old. Usual care was just as good 
as the screening um, in the younger patients. So vital AF will continue to try to answer two more questions. There are two more aims. What is the adherence to anticoagulation once the patient has been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and whether stroke prevention outweighs the risk of bleeding in these patients? The next screening trial was called the MSTOPS trial. And this was a three-year clinical outcomes in a nationwide pragmatic clinical trial of atrial fibrillation screening. It was presented by Dr. Steinhubel from Scripps. This was a study by an insurance company to determine if screening for AF was by using an ECG patch, the, the Zaya patch, can improve clinical outcomes after three years when after screening. There were 1,700 patients in the monitored group and over 3,000 matched observing, observational controls. Once the atrial fibrillation was diagnosed using the Zaya patch, the physicians caring for the patients were the ones who made the decision to recommend anticoagulation or not. What the study found was that the patch definitely increased the diagnosis and detection of atrial fibrillation, and about 45% of the patients were anticoagulated. What the study, um, this is the primary outcomes, um, the endpoint after three years, the study found that there is a significant improvement in deaths alone, but not in the other endpoints. So very interesting that there was no difference in the strokes in, in the patients who were um, diagnosed to have atrial fibrillation, and then we don't know if they were anticoagulated or not but there was also a decrease in the number of total hospitalizations and hospitalizations for bleeding. So I think what the M-STOPS um, showed was that it was a convincing data that screening for atrial fibrillation can definitely increase the detection of atrial fibrillation. But whether detecting asymptomatic atrial fibrillation and decreasing strokes has not been studied and has not been proven. And there are randomized controlled trials from all over the world that are doing this right now. And I can't wait to hear about those trials. Dr. Raphael already um, alluded to search atrial fibrillation, which was in post-op patients. This was presented by Dr. Verma from the um, University of Toronto. And they studied 336 patients from multiple centers. And what they found was in patients who were, did not have atrial fibrillation preoperatively or postoperatively, they sent them home with a cardiac monitoring. And they found that they definitely increased the number of patients detected with atrial fibrillation. Um, but we don't know if that would translate to decreasing strokes. So we can definitely detect more atrial fibrillation when we screen for atrial fibrillation, but whether that can decrease strokes is still uh, not answered by these trials, unfortunately. So we will continue to wait for those trials to tell us who we should be um, screening atrial fibrillation for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annabelle. That was an amazing overview. And as you say, we have evidence, but we do not have outcome evidence that detecting AFib is actually going to change outcomes. So thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Henry, and I will be, and he will be speaking on heart failure, another huge topic at the AHA. Hello, Dr. Les and Dr. Ritchie. Thank you for in inviting me to join this webinar. In this webinar, I'm going to share your interesting trial uh, about uh, heart failure. Uh, sorry. You can see on my screen? No, not yet, Henry. Try to share it once again. Can you, can you see my screen now? No. Sorry. 
So, uh, Henry, meanwhile, maybe we should give the word to uh, Dr. Dorina Chernikova, which, we, which will present updates uh, on cardio-oncology. Hi, Dorina, thank you so much for joining us. Um, can you share your screen and tell us what are the updates on uh, cardio-oncology, please? Of course. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, dear colleagues, it's an honor for me to participate in this webinar. And today I would like to present the topic that has come into focus of um, cardiology community. In 2020, there have been a number of updates in cardio oncology, and I want to highlight the five most challenging and relevant issues in this area to ask finally the question are we aware of the prospects in cardio oncology so let's start with modern therapy considering the scientific progress patient with cancer has the opportunity to receive effective targeted therapy that significantly improves the prognosis of survival Novel cancer therapy represents a new challenge for the clinician and a new frontier for investigation. However, the side effects of these agents have not been fully researched and long-term effects are unknown now. Thereby, in certain cases, uh, the negative impact of cancer therapy may be greater than potential benefits such as increased longevity. In a particular, immune checkpoints and inhibitors are currently in focus of cardio oncologist. The indication of ICR broadening and they increasingly used as a preferred anti cancer therapies for many types of malignancies. Use of ICR is associated with a threefold high risk of cardiovascular events, including myocardial infarction, need for revascularization, stroke, and progress of atherosclerosis. Research on cardiotoxicity related to, to ICI has focused on myocarditis as an immune-related adverse event. In consequence, ICI-related myocarditis has a reported incidence of about 1%, but it has significantly higher associated mortality to 25 to 50%. Here you can see the latest articles on cardiotoxicity of immune checkpoints inhibitors. Main risk factor for development of myocarditis following ICI therapy is combination of CTLI-4 and PD-1 inhibition, and these immune checkpoints are negative regulators of T cell immune function. Regarding the diagnostics, we can suggest the MRI is an important test to obtain when ICR-related myocarditis is clinically suspected. However, the data about MRI-specific findings are limited. So, where should we look for solutions? CTLA-4 agonist abatacep is currently being studied as possible effective treatment of severe ICI-associated myocarditis. Last year, a clinical case of patient with such myocarditis has been described in the New England Journal of Medicine, and as a result, a beta cell has led to a resolution of severe glucocorticoid refractory myocarditis that was induced by immune checkpoint inhibitors. Also, there have been case reports of successfully treated ICI-associated myocarditis with intravenous immunoglobulin, mycophenolate, and fliximab, anti-thermocide globally. However, the effectiveness of these agents in ICI-related myocarditis is unclear, and they are generally reserved for those patients who have an adequate response to glucocorticoids. At the time, five major national institutes of health sponsored oncology-based trials with integrated cardiovascular outcomes are now underway, a feature that has not previously been included in conventional oncology clinical trials. So hope to be continued. Now let's think about possible vascular and metabolic perspectives. We have perfect tool at our disposal, the statement of the American Heart Association. Novel cancer therapy frequently targets uh, the interaction between the cancer and the endothelium and may result in predictable vascular and metabolic supply. Myocardial ischemia, venous thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism likely represent the most common cardiovascular complications of malignancy. 
Recently, genetic risk factors have emerged as important common risk factors for cancer in CED. In particular, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential has arisen as a common potent age-associated independent risk for the myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure events. Those with clonal hematopoiesis have much greater risk of cardiovascular events than of development hematologic malignancy. Now it's an area in need of further exploration in cardio-oncology because they identify new risk factors such as, such as genetic risk made from new approaches for preventing and treating both cancer and CVD in population. So we turn now to prevention and rehabilitation. The cardio-oncology rehabilitation consists in a multimodal approach to patient such as identify high-risk cancer survivors for CVD. Modifications of risk factors, including blood pressure, lipid, diet, and diabetes management behavioral changes. Given the available evidence on the risk of CVD in patients with cancer and the benefits from exercise to reduce cardiovascular risk, actually there is a great need to develop and test programs specific to the care of patients with cancer using a core model. Here you can find the later and the most comprehensive toolkit for prevention strategies in cardio-oncology and even the Twitter resource. Perhaps the high quality training is the most important aspect for the realization of all mentioned strategies and for active development of cardio-oncology. The pre-existing and developing cardiovascular diseases pose some of the greatest risk of morbidity and mortality in patients with cancer. This subspeciality continues to require more expert knowledge, specific skills, and dedicated training. Here is a document that serves as a roadmap toward confirming cardio-oncology subspeciality in medicine. The process of becoming a specialist includes several stages, the need for clear understanding of the mechanism of cardiotoxicity and evaluation of CVD risk before, during, and after cancer treatment. So I would like to end my presentation with a quote that clearly reflects the prospects for the development of cardio-oncology in the world and our desire as specialists to make a certain contribution to exploring of the effects of cancer therapy and the malign influence of this disease on cardiovascular system and such. The past and the present are our means. Only the future is our goal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, dear Darina. It was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. So uh, maybe now uh, Dr. Han Nang Ton can present uh, his updates on heart failure. Does it work now, Henry? Great. Maybe you can put it in full screen. Thank you. We cannot hear you if you, if you can activate your, your microphone, Harry. Yeah. Okay. Can you share my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to share with you today in this webinar is an interesting clinical trial on heart failure uh, in Asian scientific perception. And these are the interesting clinical trial on heart failure. A, a Galactic Asia trial, Afan Asia, Sure DM Asia, on and Partrobosin and Solaris the Asia trial. But first of all, the facts tied or negative macabre in the systole heart failure trial. This this results present a new approach in that it augments a cardiac contrality device selectively binding to cardiac myosin. This increasing the number of first generated myosin, as you can see here in this picture. This, galet, this phase three galactic HF trial under the Adjective 5 Center was designed to assess omega with Megaville uh, effect on a clinical outcome. The study involved uh, 8,256 patients is a mean age of 66 years, and there was 21% of women with chronic heart failure, a class new age. NYH class 2 to 4 diseases and left ventricular adjustment fraction of 35% or lower, and with elevated natural urinary peptide. In this trial, 
all patients are receiving standard uh, heart failure therapy and it is currently hospitalized for HF or had to experience an emergency a department visit or hospitalization or heart failure in the years prior to the screening. Those patients were randomized to the omega megavir were studied at a dose of 25 milligrams twice daily, with 10 patients receiving pharmacal candidate guidance maintenance dose of 37.5 uh, or 50 milligrams twice a day. As we can see here, this triad meter covers this primary and quiet fast heart failure event or cardiovascular event. Unfortunately, our negative megabits do not have the significant inbound or change in KCC2, so same time total score, uh, or blood pressure, and a renal function, on potassium homostasis. Um, but compared with the placebo, the drug led to greater reduction in heart rate and anti-pro PNB. So in conclusion, the selectively targeting gyrosagomal the omectopy megabit is a first class of myotropy in novel pros, improving cardiac function and, and total cardiovascular outcome. In patients with heart failure, omectopy megabit statically reduced the risk of primary composites and by. But the, the, the benefit was uh, consistent across most subgroups, but the possible heterogeneity, heterogeneity of effect was suggested by potentially greater treatment effect in patients with ejection fraction of 28% or less than in those with ejection fraction of more than 28%. So uh, the pattern of adverse reaction including malvariant ischemia or ventricular arrhythmia was similar in the both groups. So further analysis for galactic Asia will provide greater insight into subgroup who may de demonstrate a greater effect in heart failure due to ejection fraction. I'm going to show you another interesting trial. There is a, a fan Asia trial of ferret carbosyl modules in iron deficiency anemia, in iron deficiency in acute heart failure. The fan Asia trial is a multi center study that was conducted at 1,108 patients hospitalized for acute heart failure at a 121 center in Europe, Israel, Lebanon, and South America, and Singapore. And all the patients in the Afani HF had the iron deficiency, uh, which was defined as the serum ferritin level less than uh, 100 nanograms per mil, or uh, if transfer in saturation less than 20%, if, uh, if the uh, serum ferritin is uh, 100 to 29 nanograms per mil. The average age in this trial was uh, 71 years, and adjacent fraction was 33%. So prior to discharge, the patient are randomized to receive uh, infravenous ferret carbosyl metals or placebo group. At the follow-up of the 53 weeks, the incident of cardiovascular death was not different between the treatment and the placebo group. As we can see here in this graph, uh, for the combined primary endpoint of total hospitalization of cardiovascular death, the total number of the event was numerically lower in the dose with the ferrous carbosyl metals compared to placebo group. The treatment benefit were also seen in secondary and by the first to uh, time to first event analysis that was set statically significant reduction in heart failure, hospitalization, or cardiovascular death. But uh, unfortunately, given the current COVID uh, global pandemic, the researcher also conducted a pre COVID sensitivity analysis, which found a numerically significant difference in the favor or annual replacement for the primary and, and as well in secondary and why. I'm going to take uh, to in the conclusion in here. I, I, I've taken this slide from the Dr. Gladys Yancy in front of his Twitter post. There's a time for the greater use of IV iron in heart failure, iron deficiency. But uh, which, uh, we should be considered, we, we should use the ions uh, 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 intravenous in heart failure reduction, but it's not necessary for because of the destroyed results. Uh, the, the trials narrowly missed its primary endpoint of total hospitalization and cardiovascular death, but it demonstrated a significant 26% drop in heart failure hospitalization. So, in conclusion, in a high risk population, we can use, uh, we can we may consider the ferrous carbosyl maltose to reduce the total number of heart failure hospitalization, irrespective of anemia status. But the treatment of carbosyl as uh, uh, ferrous colors and melters was uh, safe and well tolerated. So in iron deficiency, we can easily detect using a simple blood test and we, we should be assessed in patient hospitalization in acute heart failure. It's, it's important to reduce it like in patient with uh, heart failure. So I'm gonna move to another interesting two trial on antibiotic frozen 
that is a sugar GMH trial, and an AMBA trial was in both trials uh, to detected on the a patient with uh, uh, heart failure or reduced digestion fraction is diabetes, and based on CMR study. In sugar DNH try in this multi-center randomized small study, there was counted at 105 patients. This placebo control tried to investigate in cardiac to fat on and pack levels in a patient with NIOH fashion class 2 to 4 left ventricular adjustment fraction less than 40%, and with type 2 diabetes as well as in pre-diabetes. So in the sugar DNH trial, as we can see here. The SGLT2 inhibitor and PAC levels in reduce the LV volume in patients with half breath and a type 2 diabetes or pre diabetes. So, uh, as we see, uh, favorable reverse LV remodeling have maybe a mechanism by which SGLG2 inhibitor reduces the heart failure hospitalization. There is a fabulous power of the SGLG2 inhibitor and it reduces mortality in half breath. In MPAR proposal trial, this is a small single standard study. The page 20, 84 patients were enrolled without diabetes. The primary MPAR was changed in the LV volume to six men by the CMR study. In this double blind placebo control randomized MPAR troubles and intra clinical trial, MPAR glyphlosin in an administration to non diabetes half breast patient on total background medical therapy improve cardio remodeling and reduce LV volume and decrease LV mass. And so we can see here as increased LV systolic function, it enhanced the functional capacity, both peak oxygen consumption and six minutes water as well. The results of the embryo troubles in trial, suppose the use of LGLG3 inhibitor in the treatment of a heart failure reduction fresh in patient independently of their diabetes status. So I'm going to Move to another interesting, the solo is the ratio of trial. I'm sorry, to uh, you, Harry. Uh, sorry, you have one more minute. So <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, just go ahead and present yeah, it. Yeah, yeah this, this is my last idea. Yeah. The soda glyphlose in the patient is diabetes to resent a heart failure. And in solutions, the ratio of trial that fast randomized control to show the initiation by SGLG2 inhibition in acute heart failure in stabilized uh, patient prior to discharge or shortly there after is safe and effective. So uh, to my conclusion, a quick bit due to the time limitation, in this trial interpretation, the, the result of the trial indicates so that uh, glyphlosin has solitary effect on cardiovascular organ and many patients with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. So uh, the, the key message from this trial is the earlier initiation uh, of the, you know, the SGLG2 inhibitor may have the affected ability to see the reduction in individual composite primary outcome. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Henry. And now I will introduce uh, Dr. Chiara, who is an extraordinary physician, a brilliant uh, imaging uh, world guru, and um, my pleasure that she's with us today. Chiara. To yourself. Oh, yeah, I guess. Uh, let me start. So, thank you, Don, the updates for, um, from imaging. Um, so, thank you again for the invite uh, to be here. So, in the interest of time, I selected only a single study that created a lot of debate on Twitter. And it was really an important study on using OCT, optical coherence tomography, and cardiac MRI in patients with Minoka, in fact, women with Minoka, particularly. And this is a study part of the Women Heart Attack Research Program, HARP, from a group in New York. So Minoka, as we know, clinically is very important. Up to 15% of patients with acute coronary syndrome have unobstructed coronary arteries. It's a diagnostic dilemma. We don't know how to treat them and how to discharge them. And the mortality is not, not, um, not negligible. It's up to 5%, 12 months. So we really have to understand what these patients have to treat them properly. And both CMR and OCT are really very important techniques that can help uh, understanding the pathophysiology, what's happening. So the study was very simple in its nature, but very important findings. So patients with Minoka, patients presenting, women presenting with NMI, those with Minoka, so with unobstructed coronary arteries, so stenosis less than 50%, were recruited and underwent OCT. Um, and then out of those, um, they had an MRI within a week uh, from the acute event. 
So ultimately, 145 patients underwent OCT, and a culprit lesion was identified in 46%. As you know, OCT is, is an imaging uh, technique, but is intravascular imaging. It can detect plaque ruptures, thrombus without plaque rupture, intra uh, plaque cavity and layered plaque and, and other abnormalities, really shedding, shedding some light on the pathophysiology. CMR uh, equally uh, is very important test because we can identify infarction non-invasively. So we look at the tissue damage and non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathies like myocarditis or Takotsubo syndrome. So MRI was abnormal in 75% of the patients, was OCT only in 46%, but when we combine the information on the two techniques, that's where we make uh, the highest number of diagnoses. And in fact, I just wanted to bring you to this um, graph. Oh, by the way, there was a simultaneous publication in circulation just after the presentation, so you can find this paper online already. Um, this is very interesting. You see those, uh, those are the all abnormal MRIs. And on occasion, in fact, actually quite frequently, OCT was normal, so there was no culprit. And so this is a particular group that you know, we should focus perhaps because um, that's where OCT is now providing the pathophysiology, but yet there is an infarction. And maybe, you know, is this embolic infarctions, you know, not coronary uh, origin? Um, so the, the embol embolus doesn't start from the coronaries, but secondary, uh, perhaps, maybe. But it's really the combination of the two techniques that give us the highest diagnostic uh, accuracy. Um, only uh, in 25% of the patients, CMR was normal, which is in keeping with previous studies. So essentially to conclude, the study showed that in women with Inoka, if you do an OCT, um, you could identify the culprit in 46% of the patients. CMR is a very good technique to assess the cardiac damage as a result of the Minoka uh, event, either myocarditis, takotsubo, or in small embolic infarction, up to 74% of the patients. And that's definitely my experience, perhaps in fact, a little higher. But the combination of the two led to identify diagnosis in 84%. So is this important? Yes, it is, because it tailors treatment, secondary prevention, as opposed to not having a secondary prevention. I think it's still open discussions whether everybody should have everything, you know, both tests, or whether we should use a stepwise approach like a traffic light approach in which we perhaps do an MRI followed by OCT. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, dear Chiara. Thank you for your time. And uh, I'm sure this is a, an excellent study. We have to dip into it and read it carefully and adapt uh, it to our practice. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Anastasia Mihailidou from Australia. Anastasia, thank you for being with us. So uh, Anastasia will uh, uh, present us updates on hypertension. Thank you very much, Alessandro, and for the invitation. Apologies for coming in late. Um, I've had a few difficult. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. No. Uh, not now? So sorry. No. Not having much luck. Dis host disabled participant screen sharing, it says. Okay, so uh, it's my fault. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. Okay, try now. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Okay, let me just get into it. Oops. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to be very quick because apologies for the delay, but my focus is going to be particularly, and there was a focus from the meeting, particularly, um, as we know, um, hypertension in pregnancy. And the focus is particularly across the woman's lifespan, which I think is very important. And done, as we all know in the field, underappreciated. Um, particularly when hypertension starts, it's considered, you know, it's decades later and, uh, and the, uh, there isn't much need for immediate monitoring, but th thankfully that is changing. So there were elegant presentations. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'm just going to highlight just a few. Um, I put this up because it's such an important message in that we, usually, we know it happens, but we don't appreciate when it is happening. And... Uh, Dr. Boyd highlighted that, that 
Um, as many know that if you have preeclampsia in pregnant, once in, in, uh, during one pregnancy, your lifetime risk of uh, a chronic hypertension increases threefold. If you have recurrent uh, preeclampsia, pre it's sixfold. This is a major issue because, uh, as we know, hypertension is the number one risk factor for the majority of cardiovascular disease. And it was traditionally viewed that it was the decades after delivery. But what is increasingly become apparent, it's not decades after uh, delivery, and it's happening much earlier in, in younger women, and it is preventable. And so um, the next presentation, this was a cardiovascular seminar, was by uh, elegant studies by Dr. Miller, who's a neuro, neuro, uh, neurosurgeon, and uh, or neurophysician, I should say, and it was a great session which went from a clinical to, to the laboratory and back to the clinical, and that's where we should be going. We should be looking at mechanism-based uh, strategies, strategies, and what I've got here is an example of patients she's seen. If you note the ages, uh, ages on these um, uh, images, they're very young women. And that's concerning because originally it, it was thought it's ischemic stroke, but intracerebral hemorrhage is uh, uh, underappreciated, according to Dr. Miller. Uh, it's happening. It's usually not detected early enough because it comes under the guise of a headache. And this is a problem. It's, 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 it's uh, uh, you know, ignored. And we have a major problem in that maternal stroke is increasing, particularly in the US. Um, and this is avoidable. Uh, Preeclampsia or, or complications during pregnancy um, are a, a major contributor to that. And uh, interestingly and importantly, uh, hypertension. What are the risk factors? Hypertension, big factor, my, of, obviously age, chronic kidney disease, um, cesarean section, but the major ones are hypertension, migraine, infections, and interestingly, exposure to racism. And what she meant by exposure to racism, which is interesting because I've learned from this presentation, is if you're not white, whether you're Black, Hispanic, or Asian Pacific Islander, you have an increased risk um, of uh, complications and ongoing uh, lifetime risk of hypertension. That is a major issue that is not properly addressed and we need to do more. So very quickly, um, it, I've put this up because it, I, I love the term, it's the blood pressure stupid. That's her, her use of words. It's 30 to 60% of preeclampsia are preventable. And that's what we have to take home. We can prevent the complications. Um, a big fact I'm going to highlight here is headache. Interestingly, oops, I've put it out. Interestingly, it's been known since 400 BC it's been ignored, but a head, if, if, if women who've had preeclampsia have a headache, then we need to move to uh, um, investigation. The term, as many saw on Twitter or social media, is neuroobstetrics, which was new to me, but is, is an important part. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but highlight the basic or discovery research by Dr. Warrington, which was replicating uh, an animal model of uh, preeclampsia, the reduced um, uh, pre uh, pressure uh, in, in, in intra, uh, perfusion pressure in the um, uterine uh, as a model. It replicates many of the um, uh, 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 I've got a mentor. M many of, of, of the, the risk profile of humans, and elegantly they've shown that there's a reduced number of microglia in the cere cerebral um, uh, structures, which is an important issue because this is happening to women and, and they're much more increased risk of um, uh, cognitive deficit. And this session was wrapped up. I've put it down there as a reminder. Dr. Bellow gave an excellent summary of the overall uh, three times risk of vascular cognitive impairment with women with uh, um, preeclampsia. Importantly, the, the risk of cardiovascular disease starts early at age 40, way too early um, for um, uh, uh, women and anyone for that matter. Uh, and it is preventable by hypertension. Interestingly, I haven't got much time to go into that. They had the patient engagement and the patient um, uh, 
uh, forum. This is a, a, a great initiative that is moving across the world that we need to engage patients. They're the ones who are giving us the rich information. And this, was a, a, this is a, a prominent group which is, uh, has driven uh, ex, um, study, uh, uh, clinical trials and or, or, or cohort studies and is in contributing to bringing change and translating the message into a language that is engagement, which I think is important. And lastly, I have to highlight that measurement is important. And this is, as most of you know, by Professor Gulati. Uh, it's our study. We thank everybody who participated. But measurement, we can't just work on the numbers. We have to work on how we measure it. And we're still, most of us are not checking both arms with the initial visit. I have to highlight that if there is a discrepancy, it's usually an early marker of uh, complications. Importantly, one measurement only is not enough in the, in the clinic. And we encourage people to really highlight the importance of measurement. And just to wrap it up, because I'm sorry about time, is the whole issue of non-adherence was, uh, was a key focus uh, of this meeting. And it, it's important to, to, to look at mechanisms of addressing that. And Professor Hiramath, um, uh, a renal uh, physician uh, from Ottawa gave an elegant presentation. Apologies for the rush. Thank you so much, Anastasia. That was a brilliant overview and of a very important and emergingly recognized um, risk factor for women. And next we will have uh, Dr. Aisha who will be wrapping up with um, the late breaking clinical trials from the AHA. Aisha. Thank you, Ritsu, for that introduction. Greetings from Dhaka. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Alex, for the opportunity to present. So to round up, I'll just touch on a mixed bag of late breakers. The first is a deep dive into the soloist WHF trial, which is one of two important, potentially practice-changing trials presented last night by Dr. Deepak Bhatt. This trial investigated the effects of sotagliflozin, which is an SGLT1 and SGLT2 inhibitor on type 2 diabetic patients hospitalized for worsening heart failure, either before or within three days after hospital discharge. That's when the patients were randomized. That is soon after an acute stage of heart failure. And those with end-stage heart failure, recent ACS stroke, PCI, cabbage, and CKD were excluded. This study met its primary endpoint, which is a composite of total occurrence of CV death hospitalization for heart failure and urgent heart failure visits, which was significantly reduced by 33%. Uh, this endpoint was actually changed during the trial because they couldn't finish the trial before due to lack of funding, and therefore it was changed. However, the original primary endpoint was also met. That was a total of CV death and hospitalization for heart failure with a hazard ratio of 0.68. These effects were consistent across a number of pre-specified subgroups. It, specifically, the left ventricle ejection fraction, whether it was less than or greater than 50%, and the timing of the first dose of sotagliflozin or placebo, thus concluding that the initiation of SGLT2 inhibition in acute heart failure patients prior to discharge or shortly thereafter is both safe and effective. Moving on to the SCORED study, which looked at type 2 diabetic patients with CKD and cardiovascular risk factors. Over 10,000 patients were randomized in this trial, which also met its primary efficacy endpoint, which was the same as the SOLOIS trial. And here they showed a 26% reduction of total occurrence of death, CV death hospitalization for heart failure and urgent heart failure visits. Once again, this benefit occurred early and was statistically significant at about three months. The original primary endpoint of first occurrence of either CV death or hospitalization for heart failure was also met, as was a composite of first of CV death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. So a lot of ischemic endpoints meeting there as well. Uh, the, the primary efficacy subgroups, there was this, the, the benefit was demonstrated across a multiple uh, subgroups, specifically whether with or without a history of heart failure or reduced ejection fraction across the full range of EGFR as well as in both macro and microalbuminuria. 
Sotagliflozin also slowed the decline in kidney function after initial four weeks. And furthermore, there was a significant reduction of HbA1c across moderate and severe CKD, that is severe EGFR categories with sotagliflozin. This is unlike POSGLT2 inhibitors. And perhaps the most remarkable of them is that pool data from both Soloist and SCORD showed consistent benefits in those with heart failure with reduced as well as preserved ejection fraction. So what are the implications of these studies? Benefits have been seen across subgroups CKD with both macro and microalbuminuria, heart failure with reduced as well as preserved ejection fraction. The lower MI and stroke rates point towards an additional anti-ischemic effect of SGLT1. Glycemic control has been seen in, even in the lowest ranges of EGFR, which is unlike the POSGLT2 inhibitors, and the role for early initiation of sotagliflozin in the acute heart failure. So to quickly move on to the FISHAL trials, both of which were negative trials. So I'll just, the STRENGTH trial, which uh, randomized 13,078 patients to omega-3 fatty acid versus corn oil did not meet its primary endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0.99 but showed a significantly increased risk of atrial fibrillation with omega-3 carboxylic acid. And the OMAMI trial coming from Norway also did not meet its primary endpoint. And even here, one of the secondary outcomes was atrial fibrillation, showing a potential harm in increasing atrial fibrillation with omega-3, which they could not rule out. So this has, of course, led to much discussion on social media of how, as well as on panels of as to how one would reconcile these neutral findings of strength and omami uh, in light of positive results of reduced it trial. Uh, this is not a Pandora's box that I'd like to open at 1.30 in the morning for me, but I leave you with this tweet by Dr. Deepak Bhatt himself, who said that not all omega-3 fatty acids are the same. And to uh, wrap up, I'd like to leave you with one important message reported from the HA COVID-19 CVD registry on the effects of obesity on COVID-19 outcomes. Obesity and particularly class 3 obesity has been overrepresented in this COVID-19 registry with the largest differences being seen among younger patients with an age of less than 50 years. Uh, class 1 to 3 obesity were associated with higher risks of death in hospital death as well as mechanical ventilation. And when they uh, stratified it according to BMI, they found that significant BMI by age interactions were seen for all primary endpoints. The association of BMI with death or mechanical ventilation was strongest in those with an age of less than 50 years. So this supports a clear public health messaging need for rigorous adherence to COVID-19 prevention strategies, so mask up, particularly in younger obese individuals who may underestimate their risk of severe COVID-19. With that, I'll stop sharing my slides. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Aisha. That was a brilliant overview and lots of uh, unanswered questions. And we look forward to more science in the future that may answer such uh, of those questions. I would like to also introduce um, Dr. Haney, who's here uh, from Egypt, joining us now, um, and uh, introduce the time of discussion and would like to ask if there are any questions. One has come up, uh, which was anticipated, is there any um, uh, effect, do we know the explanation of why in both those um, soloists and solved um, uh, the other trial that SGLT1, um, was there an effect? How did it work on heart failure with preserved EF? That's a, a group that we haven't seen that kind of effect. Does anyone know uh, the answer? I know it was discussed on Twitter and didn't have a clear cut, but I, I'm not sure if anyone else knows here. Um, I know that there are ongoing trials that are looking at this question um, and are going to be unveiled next year. So we'll wait on that. Um, Dr. Haney, you asked a question and perhaps you want to ask it uh, live um, about the patients with the ligated LN. Yes, C can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, as you know, Egypt has a lot of, uh, probably like Bangladesh, has a lot of rheumatic mitral uh, valve disease. And uh, a lot of those patients are in atrial fibrillation. Some of them have pretty large left atria. And they, um, they either get mitral valve repair or tissue valves. Uh, and, uh, you know, the surgeons are very keen on ligating the left atrial appendage, uh, on excising it, actually. So those patients don't have a left atrial appendage. And as you well know, if you, if you see a patient uh, in which you don't want to give an anticoagulant, you can put a watchman or an amplatzer and actually occlude the left atrial appendage. And then you wouldn't even need to give an anticoagulant at all. And you'd leave the patient in atrial fibrillation with a similar stroke risk to those receiving anticoagulation. So my question is, uh, I mean, this is such a low risk group for developing stroke, unless the valve is obstructive, that's a totally different story because that would be like a tight mitral stenosis and would require warfarin. Uh, so uh, if, let's assume that the valve is not obstructive. These are patients who almost don't need anticoagulation. So I, I really don't see the fuss on the river study. I have certainly been giving my patients uh, all sorts of NOAX um, before the river study, I mean, I, I don't see, uh, you know, nobody ever said that um, NOx were contraindicated in, uh, in uh, biprosthetic valves. It was only in mechanical valves and in severe mitral stenosis. So I, I really, you know, I don't see the, uh, a, a huge contribution of the river study, to be honest. I agree with you, Hani. Uh, so unfortunately, Annabelle, who presented the, the arrhythmia section, I had to leave for, uh, for another uh, reunion, but uh, we will ask her in private and uh, we will share the, the, the response uh, on the website or uh, via Keith. But I agree with you, yeah. So uh, we are at the end of our session. Uh, we had some questions, but unfortunately, I think we have to end this very beautiful webinar because it's getting very late. We are at one hour and a half. So uh, I would like to, to take the time and thank, uh, uh, first of all, my co-host, Dr. Ritu Taman. Uh, I would also like to thank all the participants. So uh, I will also name uh, every speaker, which I personally thank. So Dr. Konstantin uh, Klyuchuk, uh, Dr. Rafael Vidal Perez, Anastasia Miharidou, doctor in Australia, Dr. Mirvat Alashnag, Dr. Chiara Bucerevi Gucci, Dr. Biliana Parapid, uh, Dr. Henry Han, Dr. Darina Chernikova, and Dr. Aisha Kader. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you uh, also to all our uh, participants. You can watch this on replay on YouTube and also on our website. You receive a message with a recording and we're waiting you for our um, future webinars. Uh, thank you one uh, one more time. So, uh, Ritu, maybe you, you would like to, to do some closing remarks. Thank you, Hani, also. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for... for Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Just thank you. thank you to everyone who is here for taking the time to prepare and to speak and summarize these important um, AHA trials. Um, that have huge implications for us as cardiologists in our, in, in our treatment of patients all over the world. Um, so, and thank you um, to all viewers. And um, of course, uh, Alexandru for putting all this together and creating this organization that is doing so much service to sharing knowledge across um, all countries and in this, this very difficult time uh, in this pandemic. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ritu. It's a pleasure. I hope to see you all maybe at the future uh, live congresses, but uh, until then we will meet uh, on Zoom or <laughs> Twitter. So thank you once again and have a nice evening and thank you to our audience also. Uh, thank you. Thank you.